um, so to, to talk more about a possible solution or a long-term solution, uh, I think first we need to ask the question if it's, if it's possible in the foreseeable future to see a solution. And in my opinion, I think it is even in the cases where in some countries it was the most far-fetched thing to find peace and harmony between the two populations uh, and justice, as you say. We, like, we, we know between like, the Nazis committed atrocities against the Jews and now there's an Israeli embassy in Berlin and there's a German embassy in Israel. So um, I think like the US dropped two atomic bombs on Japan and now they have very strong communities, it's very strong um, international relations between them. So I think uh, the question of if it's possible to have a solution, the answer is definitely yes. So, but I really don't, I can't, I don't have any idea what the solution is, but I think part of the solution is definitely what you're doing, which is talking to other people of your generation from the other sides, and even talking to people in America and the West in general to change maybe the international opinion about this issue. So what yeah. would you say is a possible you know, long-term solution or a part of it? Yeah. Uh, also, another to, to get back to what the beginning of what you were saying, uh, Rwanda, and in Rwanda, you had a hundred, one million people that died in um, in a hundred days. Right, it was ethnic conflict between the Hutus and the Tutsis, genocide, and now they're one of the best performing countries in Africa. Thirty years after, it's in, it's crazy how far they've come, and you know you, you we don't realize, but like call like. European colonialism was still a thing until the 1960s, right? You have people that are living on this planet that supported colonialism. Like that's like European colonialism. You have, and, and, and you know, you talk to people of the older generation, you tell them, did you ever think that the Berlin Wall was gonna fall? They're like, no, like we, they, this is just something that we grew up. And the, so, and the, I think the root of the issue is that there's no hope. There's no voice that says we can do this, especially in Israel-Palestine. There's never been a unified movement for equality and justice. It's always been us versus them. And I think that this is where our generation has different ideas. When we realize that, no, it's not necessarily us versus them. You know, you see the humanity in the other and you say, maybe we can build something together. Maybe we have all the differences in the world, but we can build something together because we recognize the importance of life. You know, when you live in Palestine, uh, you live in Gaza, you understand that life, it, it, it's, it's very valuable and it's taken away from you. Living in Gaza, you know, a part of your life is taken away from you. You live in an open air prison. But a lot of these people, especially in Gaza, they just want opportunities to live. They just want to be able to leave Gaza and go see the world, you know? They're not necessarily politically active. A lot of Palestinian youth have, have uh, gone off, the, like they don't, they're not politically active anymore because there's, number one, there haven't been elections in like 14 years for, 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 for Fatah, no, 2007. Um, and they just don't have any hope. So when you ask people, what's the solution? They're like, what do you mean solution? No, no, but yeah, we don't even, we didn't even take the first khutbah and you're gonna come talk to me about solutions. So what I think is important uh, in terms of before even, you know, you talk about the confederation or any of the stuff is you have to start generating hope uh, amongst the young populations. Um, hope that, you know, we can make a change. And I think that now we're starting to realize through, you know, the power of Matan and the Black Lives Matter movement, through the power of social media, you know, we can make a change. And it's not that far fetched to think that we can make a change. Um, even just by typing stuff on our phones. And, uh, you know, we don't really realize the, the, the power that we hold by being able to communicate like this across, about, like, you know, transnational communication and stuff like that and mobilization of huge numbers of people. So, uh, I think that this very first, before you even talk about solution, it's a very important, number one, to understand what people need and what people want um, and then to move forward from there. And then to, to have a, a leadership that is representative of the interests of the people. Because in Palestine, the, the leadership is not representative of the people. And I think I that's one of... One, sorry, continue. No, it's not. But so I, I was saying in Azam, one of the toughest obstacles in 
uh, for Palestine or for the Palestinian people is to find an um, organized way to, to find a leadership that's committed to the cause and to the people as well. I think that's a problem for a lot of Arabs, but especially for the Palestinian cause. Yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm sorry to say, but you know, uh, the, the PA cracks down a lot on people that try and like do little uprisings and stuff. Yeah. Uh, and they don't let anyone, I mean, the PA is still, you know, technically they still support the two-state solution. And you look at the polls amongst young Palestinians and people that still think the two-state solution is going to work, they're like, they'll say they're delusional. You know, this is because they, they live in a one-state reality. This is a one-state, what, what's happening in Palestine, Halla, is a one-state reality where some people have full equal civil rights and some people don't. So that's why when we say apartheid, that, that's what it is. It's, it's institutionalized discrimination based on ethnicity. Um, but that's what, that's what, for me, it's a movement and a lot of Palestinians are now more and more, they, they, Edward Said, before he died, he was very, he said, one state solution is the only way forward. There is no way that segregation is the way. For a lot of new, a, a lot of young Palestinians are more and more um, accepting and willing to, to listen uh, to a one state and to live in, in, in coexist and stuff like this. However, on the Israeli side, there's a lot more reluctance because when you benefit from a system of oppression, it's within your interest to keep the system of oppression. Mm -hmm. And when you're fed the narrative in the Kul al Arab, then like all the Palestinians are going to kill you and all this kind of stuff, you know, it, it's like, oh, why would I give up what I fought so, what my grandfathers fought so hard for? Why would I just give that up? And it's because, you know, number one, they don't see the suffering of the Palestinians because it's very, and I, I always tell myself this if you went to Gaza as an Israeli and you saw the way that people were living, how can you justify that? You know, can you actually, can you actually justify this sort of oppression? Can you justify like the four hours of electricity, the, the, the water shortages? Can you justify? I don't think so. And I think it's, that's one of the main reasons why, there, I mean, apart from, you know, the, the, the whole stopping the terrorism thing, which, you know, security coordination with the PA also played a big part in, but uh, the separation of people and the dehumanization makes it way easier to justify the oppression. But for Israelis, they don't have any incentives to change the status quo. For them, they're living their lives. Man. People in Tel Aviv are they're like, like, I mean, you know, in Tel Aviv, it's more liberal, but it's like, people are like, okay, I'm chilling, man. Like, this is my dream. You know, like, Khalas, we finally made it. We're finally yeah. recognized all this stuff. Why would I give that away right now? And I think that we need to, you know, um, we need to talk and change the discourse and make it about equal rights instead of the annihilation of the state of Israel and stuff like that, right? Which is what Mathalan Iran and Hezbollah advocate for. I'm not for that. Uh, I think that, you know, in the future, we need a state that is Jewish enough for, the, for, for Israelis and Palestinian enough for Palestinians. And uh, to be a binational state is not necessarily uh, negating the need for a Jewish homeland. I, th I think that we can have a joint Jewish and Palestinian or Israeli and Palestinian homeland. I really believe so. Uh, I think it take, it's going to take a lot of time, a lot of reconciliation, but also just a leadership that is willing to say, this is what we need, man. We can't, uh, we, we, we can't keep going with this two-state stuff. It's not realistic. And it's just for me, it's the PA buying time. They just want, because the PA gets its power from, from Israel. Without Israel, they don't have power. If, uh, they're clinging on to that last bit of, and I think that it's, yeah, any, give it some time, man. Uh, I don't want to say too much, but like, give it some time. And, and, and I think that our voices will start to be heard. Voices like me, voices like mine, voices like Rudy's. Um, I think we will start to be heard. I think it's very important to real, like, to always question the beliefs and to be able to change and not just, because this is my thing, you know, I believe right now in a one state, in a one state solution where everyone lives together, but maybe there are better solutions. And I think that the only way that we can move forward is by talking about them, by understanding why people are opposed, why people are for it. But right now we're not having those conversations. We're not speaking about it at all. I think, I think you know, just number one to spread awareness about what's happening uh, and spread awareness in a, in a way that, you know, you can get the most amount of people behind you. Because here's my problem with, um, here's my problem with like social media activism these days. It's very hateful sometimes. And I understand why it's hateful. You know, there's so much emotion 
that goes into, you know, talking about Israel, Palestine, and the families are there and people are dying, I get it. But Anna, the way I see it, in no. Your country doesn't exist. Am I going to change my mind? And I tell him, oh, okay. I'm not like, no, I'm not. If I look at it the same way for like, for, for Israelis, you know, someone says like, you know, your country doesn't exist and all this stuff. Why would they change their minds? Relax, it's just going to make them more defensive and it's going to make them think that everyone hates them. If, uh, I don't think that necessarily hate is the way. And this is what I've learned by talking to Israel. I, I've gotten so much positive feedback after the debate that I did. People telling me, you know, like, this is the first time that I've heard a Palestinian, um, you know, like willing to listen and stuff like that. And I think that listening, it fulfills, a, it, it does fulfill like this sort of psychological need to be understood, even though you might disagree, but like just listening and understanding. There's actually, there's this podcast um, where this guy who is part of the bereaved families community, it's an organization where people that have lost, people that have lost like, uh, siblings or, or their parents in the conflict, they go and they, uh, Israelis and Palestinians, they, they meet up and they talk about peace and stuff like that. His name is Omar, I think, and he, his brother was shot by an IDF soldier. And uh, he went to this community and he thought it was going to be, you know, just another one of those peace things. This is the first time I've seen an Israeli cry. And I never thought... You know, that was possible, you know? I never really thought that that was a thing that was, you know, on the other side, they felt pain. And, and when you start to realize, you know, we, we, have, we have our own goals. We have, everyone is like living their life. And we're not necessarily all inherently evil. There's a lot of evil people out there. But we're just products of our own environment. Yeah. Everyone that has a thought or a belief, it didn't just come yeah. from nowhere. It came so, from so a lot like, of experience. It, it, to mobilize people, you have to bring them, want to bring them in, not push them away. Right. And that's my problem with Tatbiyah and normalization. I get it. Um, but I think that it's important to try and bring people in and to make them understand why we feel certain ways without screaming at each other. I, I, if, if not in our lifetime, I want to, my goal is to be able to set up the structures for my kids to do it, if it's not in my lifetime. Uh, but I do definitely have hope, man. And you think, think about how much the world has changed in the past, like the internet. The internet wasn't a thing, you, you know, like it's, it's just, it's really hard to wrap your head around it because we grew up with the internet. But yeah, I mean, you, you go, imagine you go back to like, I, I always think about this, you go back to the 60s and you tell someone, you know, in, in 40, 50 years, you're going to be able to talk to people that are living, you know, you're going you're gonna to be able to talk to people that are all like the other, across the world, you're going to talk to them on a little piece of metal and you're going to be able to l look at them and listen to them and hear them and like, you know what I'm saying? So let, imagine what's possible in the next 50 years. I'd say even closer to the issue, if you go and tell maybe a person in a concentration camp in Germany in the 40s or something, that maybe your children is going to be living in, you know, in what you call Israel and the, you know, your homeland or whatever. It would be so, um, yeah. 100%. I think so I do have a lot of hope. And I think that right now, change, change happens really quickly. Uh, it, and we don't really realize it sometimes. I just hope that, it can, that I can be a part of it. I, I, want, I want to be a part of it. That's my goal in life, is to be a part of this change for equality and uh, to make the lives of people better, basically. Yeah.